Thank you, Nick. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Eric, Erika, combination of those. I am a uh, Swedish crypto fund manager slash logger slash VC, uh, but I'm also a recovering Bitcoin maximalist. And I've been recovering for about three years now. And I want to, I want to tell a story. Like, um, I think this is a story of why I'm here on, on, on this stage and the story of how um, I grew out of Bitcoin maximalism and why I think this is one of the most important things that is happening in the blockchain space right now and why I couldn't think of any more crucial uh, place to be. So I want to congratulate all of you guys that are here and I want to share my story with you with how I came to that conclusion. So like Nick said, I used to be called the altcoin slayer. In this picture you see some of the coins that I supposedly killed. They're still out there. I mean, it's really hard to kill coins, but um, supposedly I, I killed IOTA, NEO, header hashgraph. Um, and in this journey of killing altcoins, I always had this belief in, from the beginning that Bitcoin was going to be the currency that was going to, the network that was going to power everything else in the blockchain ecosystem. And the rationale for that is that if you go back, we're going to go way back in town, we're going we're gonna, we're gonna to go all the way back to 2014, when the company Blockstream was founded. So if you read the vision statement of why Blockstream was created, it is actually kind of beautiful. It's a beautiful story. So it reads that the altcoin, the altcoin approach of creating a new cryptocurrency just to introduce new features creates uncertainty for everyone looking at cryptocurrencies from the outside. There seems to be no natural stopping point. Each fork can be forked again ad infinitum. This creates both mar market and development fragmentation. We think that for cryptocurrencies to be successful as a whole, we must build network effect, not fragmentation. We believe everyone should enjoy, enjoy freedom to innovate too without seeking permission from us or anyone. We need a different way to get there than by attempting to, dis to, to disrupt our own success. It's kind of beautiful. To accomplish this, we propose technology to enable new cryptocurrency networks that do not need new cryptocurrencies. Delivering on this vision will require continued investment and in cooperation with the Bitcoin ecosystem as a whole, along with the full-time support of many people with broad and specialized backgrounds. We felt that in the Bitcoin ecosystem and in the world at large, there is, there is a so shortage of companies working on trustless cryptographic infrastructure. That's why we, along with our other co-founders who share our vision, came together to establish Blockstream. So this, this was the picture that they shared, like their vision for how the blockchain ecosystem would grow. And I like this picture so much. This used to be the banner picture of, of my LinkedIn profile. This was, was I was so um, hyped up about that vision uh, for, for, for blockchains and for sidechains to, to interact with each other. And th these sidechains, are, they're not your, they weren't originally proposed as, you know, what we see today where there's a uh, proof of authority chain with a bunch of validators. Like these were supposed to be merge mined sidechains, reusing the proof of work strength of Bitcoin to, to secure the transaction order. So, and you have the developers here speaking like, yeah, merge mining is an option. Uh, you could also have proof of stake and proof of authority, but merge mined sidechains that the reuse the hashing power of Bitcoin to secure these sidechains were a crucial element for this vision. And you can even go back and you see Greg Maxwell here talking about using snarks to interpret the programs running on side, uh, inside of sidechains, which is basically what, what we have today with, with ZK rollups. So this was already envisioned back in 2014 by the Blockstream, uh, Blockstream uh, developers. And what was the purpose of, of being able to run a snark to interpret other programs? Like, what was the vision? Well, it was the vision, the vision already then to build things like DEXs, to build trustless peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces, options contracts. All of those things that we see blossoming in DeFi were already the vision uh, back then. And in 2015, they said, you know, we're in the coming weeks, we're going to publish a proposal for a fully decentralized two-way peg 
A peg is how you transfer an asset from the main chain into the side chain and back. It would be completely decentralized, uh, and the side chain itself would be merge wind. But it never materialized. But in 2018, I still believe that this was the vision for Bitcoin, that we would see this ecosystem of side chains emerging around Bitcoin that would be trustless, merge mined. Um, so I would go around writing these Twitter threads saying like that the mo in architecture, it, it is a no-brainer that every structure of importance that we build, whether it be religious monuments, skyscrapers, pyramids, starts with the establishment of a rock-solid foundation to persist through the test of time and with the billionaires to come. So I was really in this vision that Bitcoin as the strongest, most solid uh, consensus engine would power everything else. And uh, around that point in time, we were thinking in terms of drive chains. Drive chains were the latest iteration of how to build these hash rate backed um, side chains to Bitcoin. Um, and uh, this is a pretty funny quote here. Um, so I believe that the only way to compete with Bitcoin is by figuring out how to make a more decentralized, robust consensus engine. And the problem that I had with all altcoins was, there, was that all of them were competing in Bitcoin in the exact opposite way. So they were trading away their core robustness and simplicity for smarter contracts. And this is before I understood the concept of mod modularity. Because if you think about Celestia, Celestia really is an even more simple base layer than Bitcoin is. Bitcoin bundles settlement, execution, data availability together in one monolithic piece. Celestia is that piece that abstracts the, uh, set the, the data availability and the consensus away and focuses on just that most simple piece. But this was before such constructions existed. So anyway, I was really hyped up about drive chains. Uh, I wanted to drop everything that I was doing at the time to build a drive chain. And even the Bitcoin core developers, so a lot of them were on board with this vision. They wanted to also see drive chains come into fruition. They thought it was a good idea. But something happened. This is just one year later. Just one year later, something changed. And I think it was the block size wars that got so intense. Uh, and what a lot of Bitcoiners realized is that the miners are not our friends. The miners uh, had previously been involved in every upgrade in Bitcoin. Using their hash rate, their sig they signaled their support for upgrades, and the miners were working together with the community. But during the block size wars, we kind of realized that miners weren't our friends, and we wouldn't want to give. Because in a merge mine sidechain, the problem is that the miners can always steal the coins from the sidechain, because everything is relying on the hash rate. Um, so something changed in the, in, the, uh, in, in the sort of conversation around drive chains. Uh, we, wouldn't, we didn't want to give more control to the miners. And one thing that happens when you have a merge mine sidechain is that um, if you are not validating these merge mine sidechains, you're, uh, you're, you're not mining those sidechains, you don't get the fees from those sidechains. So if they have a lot of MEV, only the miners that have very high capacity uh, bandwidth uh, are able to extract those revenues. So something changed, and, and even, P even Peter Todd, who's also one of the core contributors to Bitcoin, said that merge mine sidechains were Gregory Maxwell's big mis biggest mistake. So 2019 kind of realized that it wasn't going to happen with Bitcoin. Bitcoin was not going to become this piece that powers all of, block of, the, of the blockchain ecosystem. And then rollups entered the scene. And the, 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 the powerful thing with rollups, the, the really intelligent part is that the rollup, uh, the miners who, and the validators that process the base layer, they don't need to, to validate the rollup. They don't need to, val they don't need to process the, the transactions. They can only look at the fraud proofs and the validity proofs to make sure that those systems are safe. So this, in, if you are a Bitcoiner and you're thinking that the only, only problem that we have with drive chains is that the, the, they cause uh, centralization around mining, rollups are that exact mechanism that you need to get away from that problem. So I sort of wanted to bring this to the, to the Bitcoin community and say, hey, look at the Ethereum researchers. Look at what they have come up with. That actually solves that core piece that we've been looking for all along. 
this is, should be a very interesti interesting architectural design for how to build blockchains that can scale, that can have different execution environments, that does not call, uh, cause centralization for the validator set. So I try to convince other Bitcoiners, like, look at this, look at, the, look at the architecture of this thing, just look at the construction. If we can just learn from this mechanism, we can integrate something similar into Bitcoin, and then we would be able to realize that vision that was the, what the, what the uh, Blockstream company was built on, that core vision was now within reach. It didn't go that way. So I tried to bring it to the, uh, to the Bitcoin community, and I asked, like, I'm, I'm reading this stuff on, on the Ethereum research page, I'm reading on Vitalik's blog post, I'm, I'm finding new uh, ways that we could reach that goal, and what does that make me? And I got told that it makes me potentially dangerous. Um, and a lot of, this is, this is also a Blockstream employee, um, so I, I basically fell out of favor with the Bitcoin community just for having the idea that maybe there's something interesting going on in the Ethereum community that we should learn from. So people were starting to make, make bets around how long I would last in the Bitcoin community, and this vision that was or originally proposed about how Bitcoin would power these sidechains, what it all came down to at the end was just this. The only sidechain that Blockstream ever created was a single proof of authority chain that had no crypto economic guarantees. That was the culmination of half a decade of research that Blockstream was supposed to deliver to Bitcoiners. So Eric the altcoin slayer turned into Eric the potentially dangerous shitcoiner. And I, I was feeling miserable at this time. I, I, I started to write my own eulogy. I was, <laughs> it was kind of a sad time where <laughs> I didn't know what, what to do because you know, I had been building up my reputation and my community, my friends within the Bitcoin community for, for, seven, for seven years. Um, and, and this is what it all came to. But I found new life in the roll-up design space. There are so many things that you can do with roll-ups. You can experiment with uh, completely new VMs. You can uh, experiment with the sequencing logic, the fee logic, the MEV. Uh, you, can, you can make combinations of uh, ZK roll-ups and optimistic roll-ups. It opens a whole new paradigm for innovation experimentation. One of my favorite roll-up constructions uh, uh, is the ZK Opru construction, which allows you to make Zcash-style private payments inside of an optimistic roll-up. So you can get almost perfect privacy within an optimistic roll-up just by leveraging the fraud-proof system uh, on, the, on the base layer of Ethereum. Another thing that I think is usually interesting is the, um, the idea that if you have a roll-up and you have perhaps a more centralized sequencing mechanism, uh, that creates an opportunity for MEV to be generated in a more centralized way, and you can do things with that MEV. For example, one of the, one of the biggest problems that we've had in Bitcoin is the, how do we fund developers to keep contributing infrastructure to Bitcoin? How do we fund developers? How do we fund public goods? So this idea by optimism that we could use the MEV in a chain that the sequencer ex extracts to fund public goods is, a, is an incredibly interesting idea. And following along that path, if you have the ability to create an entirely new VM just by, because if, you, if you're running a roll-up, uh, by using the fraud-proof mechanism, you don't actually need to be able to interpret all the internal logic within the rollup itself. All you need to, to be able to do is validate a fraud proof or validate uh, a, validity, a validity proof. Those things allows you to create entirely new VMs. So inside of Fuel, which is one of my uh, uh, favorite rollups, you can, uh, you, can, you, can, you can run smart contracts using a UTXO data model and that allows for par parallelize parallelizability. So you can parallelize transactions and get basically Solana type uh, efficiency inside the rollup. So that's a whole new paradigm of, of, of an execution environment that is enabled through the separation between the main chain and rollups using fraud proofs or validity proofs. So I want to talk a little bit about what does this mean for security? So there, there is a difference between roll-ups and sidechains. Even the merge-mind sidechains that we had 
rollups are superior because, like I said, the ro in the rollup paradigm, what you can do is you don't need hash rate to secure a sidechain because the fraud proofs that get posted to the mainnet and the validity proofs, that's the only thing that you actually need to validate for the validators or the miners to do their job. So rollups present a way more attractive security model inherently than sidechains were ever, ever able to produce. But they still come with some drawbacks. There are some people who say, well, you know, rollups, they're layer two, and the layer two inherit, inherits the security of the layer one. That is you know, roughly accurate. It's not 100% accurate because there are, of course, some things that there are some, there is some level of complexity that comes with a rollup uh, that creates security risks. So it's not, it's not like one-to-one -one perfect uh, equivalency between the security of the, of, of the layer one and the layer two. There are some differences there. And I think that you know, it's good to perhaps get a grip of what those differences are. So, I mean, the most obvious one is that, of course, you're going to run into some implementation risk. The rollup, the rollup has a rollup node. That rollup node ha has its own software. There can be bugs in that software. It's just no way to get around that. Uh, if the rollup isn't implemented properly, even the, on the contracts in the layer one, uh, a bug can arise. Like, if you look at the, most of the hacks that have happened to sidechains, only a few of them uh, actually happen because someone compromised the keys. In many cases, there are simple implementation bugs that uh, can cause complete failures for the roll-up system, uh, for, for, for a sidechain system, for any type of system. So every time that you use an external uh, software component, that can have an implementation uh, uh, bug, and, and you, can, you can lose your money by, use, by using a roll-up this way. There's no way to get around that. The nice thing is that we can theoretically move away further and further away from that risk by improving our systems. Uh, with a sidechain, for example, you can never get away the inherent risk that either the miner steals the, the coins or in a proof of authority sidechain, you can never get away the risk that the, well, that the validators steal the coins in, in the sidechain. But you can get away from that risk if you design a rollup really, really well. You also have a sequencer risk in rollup. So uh, rollup doesn't use the same uh, validators. They, they don't use the same block producers as the, the, as the layer one does. They have their own set of sequencers that produce the rollup blocks, and there are some, some risks that like the, the, the most common risk that you speak about is, well, what if the sequencers start to censor the transactions on the rollup? Now, for optimistic rollups like Arbitrum and, and Optimism, there's a way around that. There's, you can post transactions directly to the layer one, track, uh, to the layer, uh, one contract on the, on the base layer. And that makes the, the rollup process those transactions. So you can get away that censorship, that censorship. It's not as easy on, on Starknet, for example. I haven't seen a design that allows uh, transactions to be posted on the layer one that will automatically be included into the Starknet rollup. Um, you also have MEV risk. I actually prefer to think of the, uh, the MEV um, difference here as an advantage, like I showed with optimism, that you can actually use the fact that you have a different set of uh, sequencers that can be permissioned or uh, have priority, and they can generate MAV, and you can, you can, they can decide that this MAV is going to go to uh, benefit the overall system. Uh, but there, there are still differences in how MAV works inside of a rollup compared to the, to the, to the uh, layer one chain. So that's also a, a risk that you've got to think about. Uh, another thing that I think that people don't talk that frequently about is something that I call state access risk. So a lot of people believe that, well, in a rollup, uh, all the transactions data are posted to the layer one, and because you have, all, you have full uh, data availability provided by the layer one system, that means that uh, you're never going to have a problem to access the state. And you need to be able to access the state if you want to be able to withdraw your funds from a rollup you need to have access to not only the raw data itself, you need access to the full state. And the risk here is that, okay, well, what if there aren't any nodes who are providing me with the state? Uh, the risk then is that you, and if you haven't produced that state for yourself, if you're not running a roll-up uh, node, which in a roll-up, uh, their execution environments are designed to be more performant. So it's going to be more resource intense to run your own roll-up node versus running a layer one node. 
So if you're not doing that, which most, most people won't do, and for some reason there is no other node that is providing you with what the state looks like, then you can run into a situation where you actually have to generate that state yourself. And if the state takes a very long time to, uh, to, to be computed, then let's say, for example, you're getting liquidated in, an, in another rollup, and now you've got to withdraw your funds from that rollup into the other rollup, and that takes time. Now you've got to regenerate the state. The time that it takes to, re to generate the state is a risk. It can cause you to get liquidated. It can cause you not to access your funds in time. Maybe those funds lose value. Like maybe there's something happening in the cryptocurrency space and your, your, your assets are losing value. You need to be able to get those out and sell those. If that takes time, well, then, then that's, that's a risk. I'm coloring these in yellow because these are not like catastrophic risks. They're more like medium, me mediocre risks. And then you all, in, in most of these rollups, the, the reason that these two are white is because these problems are not inherent to rollups themselves, but it's something that we're likely to see with most rollups. So most rollups in the beginning are going to have admin keys, the ability to make emergency upgrades. Uh, that, of course, is a risk. Um, the idea is that we will move away from those uh, training wheels with time, and we won't really have these admin keys that can change the entire rollup system uh, once these systems are mature. But they're probably going to be with us for a couple of years, these types of admin keys. And a lot of these rollups are also planning to add governance tokens. And governance tokens also provide a, uh, an attack vector. Like if the governance tokens has the ability to vote on something crucial for the system, then uh, if someone is able to acquire a large amount of those governance tokens while well, they get control of a part of the rollup. So that's also uh, a risk. Um, the most secure rollup would probably be a rollup that doesn't use, like if we had no implementation bugs, then the most secure rollup would probably be a type of rollup that has had as little as possible of these types of uh, admin keys or, or governance tokens, uh, or at least limit their ability to, to do anything material to the system at all. So those are some inescapable things that you sort of get with rollups that make the security different from the layer one, uh, the layer one itself. So then there are also differences between zk rollups and optimistic rollups. I'm not going to go too to get too bogged down into this, but it's good to have at least the the basics of it. I think that most people in this audience probably do do know the the, the basic security assumptions that trade-offs that you make between a zk rollup and an optimistic rollup. Uh, the ZK rollup, of course, uses Starks or Snarks. Those have uh, significantly higher complexity and a lot fewer people that actually understand those systems in detail to be able to audit them to a level where we have uh, an assurance that the system is going to work as intended. So they are more complex. The, the probability that they have implementations bugs are significantly higher. Even though in a system like Arbitrum, for example, the Arbitrum virtual machine is also quite complex, there's also an added risk of complexity there. But I don't think it's fair to say that these risks are comparable. I think it's probably fair to say that the ZK rollups do add a more material layer of risk. But in the optimistic rollup, you have the assumption that someone is watching the chain, that someone, if the, if the sequencers post an invalid Merkle root, then a Merkle root commitment, then someone needs to be able to, to produce a fraud proof and invalidate that update. So Rollup has this other uh, trust assumption that you need to trust that someone is watching the chain. Either that has to be you or that has to be someone else. And ZK Rollups don't really have that, this assumption. And then um, if you are using another system or another component to provide data availability, then you're always exposed to the underlying risk of that system. We used to say that uh, Validiums, for instance, uh, a Validium is a ZK rollup that uh, does not actually post the data on the layer one. Um, it uses another, comp uh, another entity or a federation of entities to uh, guarantee that that data is there. We used to say that uh, that these validiums had a lower risk profile because the only thing that they could do is freeze the funds. They could freeze the system, but they couldn't uh, steal the funds. But we've sort of come to the conclusion that you know, uh, if you're able to freeze the if you're able to freeze a rollup, it's very easy to uh, turn this into a ransom situation where you're ransoming the funds, and, uh, and even if you have emergency keys, which allows you to roll back the state of the, of the Validium, 
that o opens us up another attack vector which allows the attacker to double spend their funds because when you roll back the attack, then, no one can, then, then the attacker can just do that attack again. So you create a double spend risk. Um, so no matter how you want to wrap the burrito, uh, if you're using other data availability systems, you're always going to run into this issue that you sort of have to trust that those components are functioning uh, correctly. So I also have this picture. I saw that Mustafa had this one earlier. I want to make a joke about this. Is, this is the modular conference. So we're outsourcing other people's uh, diagram skills to the ones that are most suitable to create those. So that's my excuse for, for, for using other people's diagrams in this, in this talk. Um, so we sort of, we sort of covered, covered everything except these two so far. We're talking in very, very bro uh, broad strokes, but I don't think that you're going to be able to, to learn everything about every single trust assumption between different rollups in, in, in a 30-minute talk, but let's talk about the broad strokes here. So uh, if you're running a rollup on Celestia, there is a difference between sovereign rollups and settlement rollups. So the sovereign rollup uh, has its own uh, settlement and execution environment. So that allows for a lot of flexibility because you can uh, hard fork or soft fork the rollup itself and change the rules of that rollup without having to depend on any other community. Celestia is not going to stop you from changing the execution environment of your rollup. So if you want to change something of it of in the inside the execution environment, you can in a sovereign rollup. That uh, gives you flexibility. That, that's, that's why they're called sovereign rollups. Uh, but that does mean that uh, the rollup can change if, as long as the rollup community decides that the rollup should change. And that means that you know, if it's a small community, if it's a small rollup and they are malicious, they could hard fork and, and perhaps you know, steal your funds from that, from that rollup. So you, you have this different risk profile in a sovereign rollup versus a, a, a settlement rollup. The, the benefit of a settlement rollup is where you share uh, an execution environment where many different types of rollups uh, can uh, settle their um, uh, fraud proofs and validity proofs. And if they were all batched together in one layer, then one rollup can't go rogue and hard fork uh, their system because that makes them incompatible with all those other rollups that they have enjoyed the uh, ability to, 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 to interact with. So if you're bridging, if you're using a settlement rollup for the, the uh, compatibility with other rollups, now you, if you can't hard fork one of those. So it sort of ties all of those rollups into that specific settlement layer. So using a settlement rollup with many rollups sort of batches their uh, security together. Um, in, a, in a different way. Um, last thing, I, I wanted to steal another uh, diagram here from, from Maven. Rain and Coffee made this excellent chart, I think, that shows a little bit easier how these different rollups interact with the, with the Celestia system. So on Celestia, you can have these, you can have a sovereign optimistic rollup, you can have a sovereign ZK rollup, uh, and then you can have these restrict, restricted settlement layers for rollups. Uh, like Sevmos, but you could also have other 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 uh, settlement um, rollups like that uh, on on which you can build other rollups. Um, that sort of gives you a better picture of what what the uh, ecosystem looks like, I think. And uh, if you want to get really bogged down into the very nitty gritty differences between an optimistic rollup and a Validium or a ZK rollup, I think that uh, Matter Labs uh, did a quite good deep dive into the uh, nitty gritty differences in terms of security, but also performance, usability, and other aspects that you can look at. So I would recommend to read uh, from this website. It, it's, it's not 100% perfect. You got to realize that Matter Labs, uh, they have a ZK rollup themselves, so they might be a little bit more biased towards ZK rollups. Uh, with that, that was the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Um, great to see you guys. So many of you here. I don't know if